uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, what went wrong then if we were going to wait till 2020? Well, nothing's gone wrong, but it's always a good idea to trust the British people and ask them for their say. Uh, I've always thought that the Fixed Term Parliaments Act was a constitutional monstrosity. It went against the grain of how our constitution works. And I think we are getting to a point where a new Prime Minister requires a mandate directly from the British electorate. So I think what she's doing, what Mrs May is doing, is goes with the grain of the British constitution and there is a sensible I mean, a suggestion in the newspapers yesterday, the Sunday Times, that the manifesto will actually include abolition of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Well, I would rejoice at that. I think it's a, a mistaken act, partly because, as we've seen this morning, it's entirely ineffective. No opposition leader can say, oh no, I'll be opposed to a general election because I'd really like you to carry on in government. That's not a position an opposition leader could ever credibly take. So it's a bit of constitutional vandalism that doesn't work. Why do you think she needs a larger Conservative majority? That's what she's asking for. I don't know whether she's going to get it. Why does she need it? Is it actually because of people like you pushing her further towards hard Brexit and the right all the time? Uh, no. Um, the issue is not people in my position because if Mrs May wanted to do things that people like me didn't like, she would get support from the Labour and the Lib Dem and the Scottish National benches. So there's no question of the Brexiteers holding the government around. So you have pushed them quite a long way already, haven't you, towards leaving the single market, leaving the customs union? That's a complete misunderstanding, as, as you know perfectly well, that um, the numbers don't add up that way. That if the Tory Brexiteers, people who campaigned for Brexit, voted against the government, the government would always get its business through because the pro-Remain are a much larger number in the House of Commons. It's never been a risk uh, from the pro-Leavers, and that's always, to my mind, been a misunderstanding, a misspin of events. But she is the leader of the Conservative Party, and she would like to keep her party together, wouldn't she? Uh, yes, but that means keeping those who voted Remain on board as well. So I, I don't think this is about uh, the minutiae of party management. I think it's about getting a mandate for difficult decisions that need to be taken, uh, decisions in relation to Brexit, but also uh, in relation to economic activity, that we've had questions raised about whether with the strains on the defence budget, with all that's going on in the world at the moment, a very uncertain world, whether the 0.7% guarantee on overseas aid is still appropriate. But that was a manifesto commitment. And before manifesto commitments are changed, you need to go back to the electorate. So I think it's getting a mandate for Mrs May's vision of government. And I think that's the right thing to be doing. Certainly underlines the sort of massive change that's been within Conservative Party policy uh, since the uh, last general election. I think that's right. I think we have a quasi-presidential system and the views of the Prime Minister are extremely important and is why I do feel we are moving constitutionally, evolving to a situation where it will be expected that a new Prime Minister gets a new mandate. When Gordon Brown didn't, that turned out to be a great mistake for him and I think doing it within the year of taking office, Mrs May is making the right choice and crucially going with the development, the evolution of our constitution. What do you think the prospects are for this general election? How confident are you that she will manage to secure a stronger mandate? Well, I think one should always be cautious. As the opinion pollsters have got practically everything in the last few years catastrophically wrong, I wouldn't put money on what they say today. But I feel the mood of the country is that they want Brexit to be implemented effectively. They like the clear leadership that Mrs May gives, the sense of direction. They like the values that she expresses. So, yes, I'm full of hope, full of optimism. Jacob rees this is a power grab by the executive. It's not giving power yeah, back to the sovereign parliament. Words. I think that's a misunderstanding of what's happening. This is a two-stage process. Currently, all those powers are with Brussels. They will come back to Westminster, and from there, I hope and expect many of them will be devolved, and that will be a matter of discussion between the devolved parliaments and the United Kingdom parliament. And parliament will then determine what laws are made in future. Because as was established, if, yes, it will. If, if no. the secondary powers are used by the government, secondary it won't. legislation always goes through parliament. Now, sometimes, it yes, it does, even on a negative resolution. If enough MPs object to a no, secondary no, resolution, completely wrong. The sorry, government, sorry, no, Jacob. No, no, no. Yeah. The government cannot resist a prayer so, sorry, against. Jacob, I'm no, sorry, I'm no, going no. to correct you because in 2014-15 yes. there were 19 yes. prayers against, and, 19 and not a single one led to a vote. But the 19 Last prayers year, did not have a majority of Parliament praying against it. So you've it. got to have a majority. No, That's no, the no. Government. <laughs> no. What I am saying 
is that for secondary legislation there always has to be either the tacit or implicit consent of Parliament. But there that isn't, is always well, the case. You, the only way you can assess whether, got, there's the, whether there's the assent of Parliament is if you have a vote got, and a debate. And the got, government over the no, last two years simply hasn't been allowing us to do it. If you've got 326 MPs to support a prayer against a negative instrument, you would find that there was a vote in Parliament <laughs> invariably. Well, As it happens, maybe, I do no, agree with you that the can, government can, should be more open to allowing prayers against the negative resolutions when yeah. signed can by we, can, can, leading figures in the opposition. Can, can I be helpful and just to help? Sort of, can, can we, can... Two MPs, one Labour, one Conservative, the Shadow Schools Minister uh, for Labour, Mike Kane, and uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg from the Conservatives. Uh, you were tipped as a speaker at one stage, weren't you, a future speaker? Anyway, what's the mood of Conservative MPs, given the result? How would you describe it? Uh, since the 1922 committee meeting last night, the mood of Tory MPs is really very positive. That Theresa May's performance yesterday was very strong, and today people really want to get behind her, support her, and back her, and get the government up and running. What do you think of what Mr Corbyn said about how this might be a very short parliament, another election soon? It's one of politicians and journalists' favourite sports, speculating about when the next election will be. And we thought all the fun of that was taken away by the Fixed Term Parliament Act, but it's back. Uh, I'd note that Attlee only managed one year with a small majority, uh, but that Harold Wilson and Callaghan managed almost the whole of the five-year period with a small majority. So sometimes you can go the whole time, sometimes you can't. Mike Kane, what's your prediction about how long this parliament's going to last? How do you see the, the months ahead? Well, we saw the re-election of John Burko today. I think the government would have dearly loved to, at one stage to have moved against him, but they were powerless to do so. And we saw a Prime Minister with all authority uh, ebbed and gone away from her, unlike what Jacob was saying about the Wilson and Callaghan administrations, particularly Wilson. He was on the op, and you saw that upbeat mood today on the Labour benches. Very different. I mean, I can remember lots of Prime Minister's questions where Labour MPs have sat on their hands, sat there with glum faces. A lot of humble pie being eaten by Labour MPs in the tea room, is there? Well, I think what you saw was the party come together, particularly after the second leadership election, and you just saw one of the best campaigns of modern political history, which, you know, produced a result that was absolutely unexpected, let alone six months ago, let alone four weeks ago. Uh, and you see now Labour back in the game, on the ascendancy, and who knows what will happen over the next few days. Jacob brees what are the really tricky problems facing Theresa May and the Conservative government. Brexit, I guess, is one. How do, what do you see as the main challenges and the dif difficulties for Theresa May and the government now? Within Parliament, I think Brexit is relatively straightforward because the Great Repeal Bill is contingent on the referendum result. What will be hard will be getting routine legislation through and will be getting every detail of budgets through. And therefore, the government will have to be very cautious about any legislative programme that it has. What it does as an executive doesn't need parliamentary consent will be as straightforward as it normally is, but anything that requires legislation, other than, as I say, the Great Repeal Bill, uh, is going to be hard. The first uh, time MPs will get a chance to vote, of course, will be on the Queen's speech. What's, what's Labour's approach going to be on the Queen's speech? Mr Corbyn's talking about getting the other parties to come together. What chances are there of that, do you think, uh, of a combined uh, Labour, SNP and other parties uh, uh, joining together to... Uh, either to put forward an alternative Queen's speech or vote uh, the government's uh, speech down? Well, the first thing I'd say, John, we're five days after a general election with no f um, sign of a government being formed and no in end in sight of when a government uh, we f will be formed. We don't know if we'll even be back next week for a Queen's uh, speech yet or not. And at the moment, uh, Labour sticking to its manifesto and not conducting conducting negotiations uh, with other parties. It'll be up to the Prime Minister to see if she can form a government and as of yet there's, there's been no sign of that. Um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, David Davis. Because constitutionally it's not accurate. The government simply continues that there has been no change of Prime Minister. An election does not mean the change of government. The government is not reappointed. The old government remains in office. So it's wrong to say there's been no formation of a government. The Queen's government is being carried on as usual. Right. My question was going to be, David Davis and others have conceded that various bits of the Conservative manifesto are going to be dropped. Which bits of the Tory manifesto would you like to see dropped? Well, I think it's a statement of the obvious that some bits will uh, be dropped. I think the not fully thought through social care policy 
uh, will be dropped. I expect uh, the removal of the fuel allowance uh, will be at least suspended or altered from what it would have been. I have a nasty feeling we'll find it much harder to get through uh, the repeal of the vicious section uh, of a bill on press freedom that we were going to do because the Labour Party quite likes bashing our free press and the House of Lords does too. So there'll be some very good things that we'll probably lose as well as some things that weren't necessarily fully thought through. What are the things that Labour will be demanding are dropped from the government's programme? Well, the biggest vanity project for the Prime Minister's, which is a personal project for her, was grammar schools. She's reappointed Justine Greening, who marginally won her seat in Putney, and she's no fan of grammar schools. So she's got cabinet ministers now and the backbenchers calling the shots. Uh, she's in office but out of power. What would you like to see happen to the grammar schools policy? Well, as it happens, I support the grammar schools policy, but I thought it was a distraction in the election debate because it'll be a very small number of schools even if it happens. I doubt there is now a majority to get grammar schools through and you have to face political reality. Prime Ministers and Chief Whips always need to be able to count. They can't get their business through if they don't have a majority and there's no point in using political capital up on things that simply won't get through Parliament. But that doesn't mean we can't have a government that is doing all sorts of other important things, ensuring, ensuring that the Academy's programme um, continues to roll out, which has been improving standards dramatically across the country. I, I'm sure you remember from the campaign, 1.8 million more children in schools that are now good or outstanding thanks to academisation. So there's lots of good stuff that can carry on and we can ignore the side shows. Very quick word, you, very quickly, you are the shadow schools minister. Interestingly, Jacob corrected me earlier, I'll correct him. No, no sign that academies, uh, academisation has improved standards. Those 1.8 million children are in schools that were identified by Labour uh, in 2010 that needed improving. So they're dining out on Labour's records. Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Conservative MP who campaigned to leave the EU, and Sir Vince Cable, the Liberal Democrats and former Business Secretary who has just been re-elected as the MP for Twickenham. Jacob Rees-Mogg, let me start with you. So Robert's saying there that there is some confusion from EU leaders about the, the state that, the, that Britain is in going into this. Are we not just immediately hamstrung by the precarious situation the government is in? I don't think we are because Article 50 was passed into law thanks to the um, valiant efforts of Gina Miller and that means that with or without a deal we will leave at the end of March 2019. So now the question is do we do this smoothly or do we do it abruptly and there is the beginning of the negotiation. Uh, it's fascinating that if you look at the Labour Party manifesto, it was saying that we would be out of the single market and effectively out of the customs union. The Conservative manifesto was explicit on that. Uh, the combined vote of the two was over 80%. So the position of the British people hasn't changed since the 23rd of June last year. Vince Cable, the position of the British people hasn't changed. Well, it has changed because we had an election and the centre of gravity has moved and it's very clear there is no longer any support in Parliament and I would suspect in large areas of the Cabinet for uh, rejecting a deal altogether. I mean, that option that Theresa May was keen on, I think, is now very much off the table. Uh, the, the three big issues they're talking about at the moment, you know, the issue of money, citizenship and the Irish border, these are very tricky and complex issues, but they're a compared with the much bigger question about whether we stay in the customs union or leave, whether we stay in the single market or leave and what the single market means. And these are the big things that affect the economy. The government is clearly divided on those issues. There's a different makeup in Parliament and the government's going to find it very, very difficult to push through the more extreme form of Brexit which initially they favoured. So if the general election showed there was no endorsement of a, a hard Brexit, then it also showed Lib Dems losing their share. There's no endorsement of a second referendum either. Either. So what is the, the broad public opinion at the moment? Well, it, it's changing and, and I, I think the simplest way of characterising it is that there are probably now three broad groups. The, the, there are those who are you know, hardline Brexiteers, there are people who are still not reconciled to leaving and there's a large number in between who have accepted that we've moved on with the referendum but want minimum disruption, who want what in the jargon is called a soft Brexit. Now whether that's deliverable and how it's deliverable within the very short time frame is very much open to debate. Jacob Rees-Mogg, how do you respond to the idea that there was, now this is more in the hands of Parliament, but there were no cross-party talks before David Davis went to Brussels? Was this premature? 
Uh, no, of course not. We have to get on with um, the government of the country. We have a separation between our executive and legislative branches. That's a very long-standing nature. The executive gets on with the details of negotiation and is held to account by Parliament. That's how it's always happened. And our Prime Minister is the person who commands a majority in the House of Commons. And as long as Mrs May continues to do that, she is the Prime Minister, she has the authority to negotiate, she has the confidence of Parliament. And Brexit is actually surprisingly straightforward. It means we're leaving the European Union. That means leaving the single market, which is the major instrument of the European Union, and leaving the customs union because that will allow us to do our own trade deals and to have cheaper food, cheaper clothing for people up and down the country. It will lead to better living standards for people. And that's a really exciting prize to get from these negotiations. Surprisingly straightforward. I haven't heard that uh, no, as a phrase applied phrase. to Brexit every, much. I think everybody else could <laughs> believe it's unbelievably complicated. But just to highlight that one issue of the customs union, I mean, it's clear that there are very big divisions on that. And the Labour Party, which has supported Brexit, is now saying we must stay in the customs union. Um, I think some members of the Cabinet were there too. Because to leave it would have massively disruptive effects on our supply chain industries. I mean, I spent five years in the Cabinet promoting the British car industry the aerospace industry. Now those industries depend on widgets, you know, going backwards and forwards without any inspection, without tariffs. The idea that we can negotiate attractive new deals that make a difference, I mean, I think has already been disproved. I mean, Mrs. May's attempt to get some special deal with India, one of the major emerging powers, I mean, she was simply sent packing because we're not willing to concede the kind of things that matter to the Indians. And if we really want to do more trade in China and India, Brazil, we just get on with it. I mean, the countries like Germany and France are ahead of us in those markets. We don't need negotiated trade deals to do it. You're keen to interject. I, I am indeed, because this is the classic, narrow, European, inward-looking approach. Our supply chains include countries from around the world. We import uh, from all over the world and we export more to the rest of the world than to the EU. So we have supply chains already with America and with India and with China and we manage that through our borders with incredible efficiency. Things coming through the port at Southampton speed through with all the customs declarations done before the items are landed and the final approval is given as they're in the crane going off the ship onto land. This is all in place for other countries. We can do the same with the EU. Leaving the customs union is simple. And there's a great habit of the political class, like the Wizard of Oz, to pretend that there is a great mystery about these things. But actually, they are fundamentally very straightforward. We're leaving the European Union, we will have control of our laws, we will control our borders, and we will make trade deals with the rest of the world. The EU don't want to make this easy for Britain. They want to set an example so that others don't follow suit. When you couple that with the weaker position that we have going into this, what's your prediction for how all this is going to pan out? Is this going to be a complete unmitigated disaster? Well, if I was wanting to be a doom monger, I would, would say the potential for disaster is actually quite large. But, but no, but there is another option. I mean, I, I think one of the things that's opened up in the last few days is the European Union says, if you want to drop all this Article 50 stuff, you know, and just go back to where we were, there isn't a problem. And that's something they haven't said before. And I think that it, the, the more difficult it gets and the more complex it gets, I think we, you know, we're going to have to look at a wide range of options now. And it may just include pocketing most of the status quo. So Vince has let the cat out of the bag. The people who are calling for a soft Brexit don't want us to leave. They want the Article 50 process to be quietly knocked on the head. Mm. The British people voted to leave. They would be cheated. If we didn't, and our democracy would not be respected, it would be a deep scandal. And that the EU is suggesting it shows the contempt the EU has for democracy and is why it made other countries vote until they gave the right answer. The British people aren't like that. Well, they just had an election which shifted the balance uh, in a over, quite radically different way. Over 80% of people voted for leaving the single market and the customs union. The Labour Party said very little on Brexit because they knew it was popular. The Lib Dems, the um, Scottish Nationalists, opposed Brexit and they saw their vote decline. We'll have to end it there. But this week it's been suggested that there's a new, unlikely political star of social media. Here's Ellie Price. What greater pleasure can there be for a true-born English man or true-born English woman to listen to our own national anthem. Now, Mr Speaker, or the, my right honourable friend, the member for Buckingham, as he now is, uh, has a reputation for being a moderniser. 
This is a word I use with some caution. <laughs> Let me indulge in the floxy knocking nihilopilification of judges of the European Union. There are times when a nation needs a hero, an icon on whom we can all depend. I've heard people say. Now might not be one of those times, but there seems to be loads of people at the moment who just really love Jacob Rees Mogg. Maybe it's because he himself posts to social media even when he's faced with setbacks. Maybe it's because he has such a strong and youthful campaign team behind him. And maybe it's because he seems to have cross-party support. Whatever it is, the Reese Mogg has inspired a generation of photoshoppers and meme creators on the internet, and he gets everywhere. So much so that someone's even interviewed him about what he thinks of these memes, and that's been really popular. I always think it's important to sit comfortably in the chamber, particularly if you're in there for a long time. And it doesn't stop there. There's even a campaign to make him PM. What is it about Jacob Rees-Mogg that you love so much? I think it's because um, he's a little bit eccentric. He doesn't take himself so seriously. So how many people have signed up to the campaign? <laughs> so we have uh, just over 12,000 signatures so far and uh, 4,500 people have liked us on Facebook. Gosh, that's a lot of, that's a lot of re-smog love. Yeah, it is. And uh, I've got to say, I'm actually surprised that we kind of, we've got this big in, in such a short period of time. His support isn't just the grassroots of his power base in North East Somerset, but as his local paper once said, he's got Mogmentum. <laughs> so is there love for Mog in the studio? There's absolutely massive love, love for Jacob. I've worked with him often and, uh, yeah, we're all Mogg fans. Member of the committee, Jacob Rees-Mogg, contempt of Parliament. Why? Well, the issue is breach of privilege, that a humble address, an humble address, is deemed to be binding and all previous precedent is that a humble address is binding. And therefore the government has an obligation to meet the terms of that address. It's not now the government's discretion, it has got to fulfil a demand of Parliament. Of course, the government can't provide information that it doesn't have. Nobody's asking for that. But it has to provide information in the terms set out in that motion passed two or three weeks ago. So what happens if David Davis says, I'm sorry, I simply do not have that information. I cannot comply. Well, if he doesn't have it, then that's not what was demanded. The motion demanded information that the government has. So on that bit, he's absolutely fair to say, I don't have this information. What is much harder for him is to say this information is confidential. The motion didn't uh, differentiate between types of information. The government could have amended the motion. They could have voted the motion down. They did neither of those things. And therefore, they, by accepting the motion, must accept the responsibility to provide the information that they do have in relation to that motion. Well, what do you say to maybe, I don't know, Conservative supporters watching you saying, hang on a sec, you are a Conservative MP. You are landing David Davis in deep doo-doo. Well, it's that the whips didn't vote down or didn't ask us to vote down a motion that the exiting European Union Department is now saying is very difficult for it. The government allowed this motion to pass unanimously. The government accepted this motion. The government, therefore, has agreed to the terms of the motion. Having done that, it can't turn around and say, well, we won't actually do it. If that's its position, it ought to have voted down or asked MPs to vote down the motion in the first place or to put down an amendment limiting the effect of the motion. And it is still open to the government to put down a motion to amend the humble address to protect information that it is concerned about. And I think that would be the wise thing for the government to do. We know one of the central arguments of the Leave campaigners was it was about taking back control to Parliament. So in that context, how damaging potentially would this be for the government and David Davis should a motion be put down suggesting that Mr Davis had defied Parliament in effect? Well, we're a long way from that. That um, The issue of breach of privilege can be raised privately with the Speaker. If the Speaker then accepts it, it can go to the floor of the House and then to the Committee of Privileges. We're a long, long way from the Committee of Privileges considering whether there has been a breach and plenty of opportunity for the government to bring itself in line with the motion. But where humble addresses have been ignored in other Commonwealth parliaments, it has been a very serious matter. But your concern is basically a constitutional one. You're not too fussed about the contents of these documents. My position is that I would happily have voted uh, to stop these documents being made public. That isn't my concern 
in this instance, my concern is the powers of the House of Commons versus the executive. And the key thing for people like me and other Conservatives to remember is that we will be in opposition one day. And these protections exist to prevent governments from behaving in an arbitrary and overbearing fashion. That is why the House of Commons has rights. If when in government, the rights of the House of Commons are ignored or abused, then when we are in opposition, we will not have a leg to stand on when we criticise future governments. So constitutionally, this is of significant importance. Uh, and the government has to follow an humble address. All precedent says that it is binding. Jacob Rees-Mogg, thank you very much uh, for your time.